Good morning. It's great to be with you, and we appreciate so much your presence in this uh, worshiping of our God together here in spirit and in truth, and particularly in this live streaming of our morning services here at the Central Church of Christ in Martinsburg, West Virginia. We're glad that uh, you're able to tune in. Appreciate you doing that. I hope this will truly be a blessing in your life. This evening at 6 o'clock, uh, our elders have invited group B plus to assemble in person here at the church building. Group B plus is those aged 18 to 45 with children. This is the largest of the groups. This is the only group which is invited to be here in person this evening at six o'clock. I just want to say a word to you folks that are in that group. If you are uh, debating or um, discussing in your mind or in your family whether to come. I want you to know that the pews have been arranged in a way that is uh, marked in a way where social distancing is facilitated. There is seating only in every other pew and there is a distance between persons in the auditorium. Uh, there is the wearing of masks throughout the worship service except for those up front, such as myself at this time, or those leading prayers, leading singing. If you still feel a little uncomfortable with that, I also want you to know that the fellowship or multi-purpose room has been set up for those who would prefer to worship apart from anybody else. And there is a large screen available there where you can both see and hear the services and participate, much like you're doing at home, only you would be here in the building and have the chance to see others if you, if you would desire to do so. Our elders are encouraging all fellowship to occur, all, all uh, discussions and greetings and so on to occur outside of the church building. We're not doing a lot of socializing in the building, trying to be respectful of the guidelines that have been issued and also try to gradually get back to a, a, a normal in-person assembly. So I thought you would appreciate that information. If you elect to stay at home and, and watch uh, by live stream, you certainly can do that. And we appreciate so much the, the uh, technological services that are being provided, which allows us to do that. This morning, I want to uh, present to you some thoughts in, in furtherance of a series which we have began a long time ago, uh, which we come back to from time to time, entitled Great Bible Questions. There are some amazing questions that are asked in the Bible, and of course the answers are provided, not necessarily in the same verse, but they are provided in the Bible. We looked at quite a few of these from the Old Testament, and more recently, we have been looking at some great Bible questions of the New Testament. And so this morning, I want to present one of those for your consideration, for you to think together with me about this. Very, very important. And I hope it will be an encouraging question to you, as it has been to countless others uh, down through the ages. Let me remind you that if you are asking questions in life, that's a good thing, generally, provided that you are asking them honestly, which I know you are. You, I get questions uh, frequently, regularly, by email and by text and by letters and by in-person questions, sometimes asking, you know, what, what does a particular verse mean or, what, or would you preach a sermon on this or that subject? I appreciate those questions. I really do. Um, it tells me that you are interested in the answer. I think when the time comes, folks, that we stop asking Bible questions, it's because we no longer care what the answer is. And that's certainly not a good situation. So I commend you if you are searching the scriptures daily, if you are asking questions, uh, uh, and if you're going to the Word of God in order to find the answers to them. Today, let's focus together on this question. Found in Romans chapter 8, I'm going to read it from the King James Version, verse 31, says, If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, 
who can be against us? First thing I'd like us to notice about that question is this point. We are in a battle. And I'm talking now to you Christians who are listening to my voice, you who are members of the church, who are striving to live a faithful Christian life. You need to understand that we're in a battle. We're in a war, a conflict, and it is one of momentous proportions. Now, it's not what you might expect when you tell people, Uh, You know, I like that song, Onward Christian Soldiers. Well, right away, some people recoil from that, and they say, whoa, I I think of the gospel as love, and I I don't like to think of it in battle terminology. Well, I, I get that, but I would challenge you to recognize a simple fact here. If you are living for Christ, it's not promised that it's going to be a bed of roses. It's not necessarily going to be smooth sailing all of the time. Look at the life of Christ. Was he not engaged in heated battle on numerous occasions, resulting or culminating there finally upon the cross of Calvary? And really, that wasn't the end of the story, was it? There was the resurrection after that. But I'm I'm showing you that it can be, at times, a, a life of conflict. Jesus said, I didn't come to send peace. That's a misconception. Now, there is a peace involved in living for Christ, but he said, I I came to send a sword to set mother against uh, daughter and father against son and so on. So we're in a battle. Let's let's acknowledge that and, and understand what that means to each one of us. Now, let's think for a moment about what this battle is not. What the battle is not. I'm not talking now about picking up arms, physical arms, uh, going out, you know, arming ourselves with shotguns or semi automatic weapons or automatic weapons and, and, and engaging in some kind of militaristic type conflict. I'm not talking about that. You know, the followers of Jesus at times must have thought that he was going to, to start some kind of military conflict. Lord, dost thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Finally, Jesus, who had, had heard that question enough, said, look, it's not for you to know times or places. <laughs> but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Well, we're not in a military battle. Here's the way Paul expressed that in the first part of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. He said, for our wrestling is not against flesh and blood. Now notice that. Our warfare, our battle, is not against each other. It's not against people. It's not against places or things. It's not against material Reality. He says it's not against flesh and blood. Now that right there differentiates this battle from all others. We're in a battle, and it's a serious one. All right, then, if it's not against flesh and blood, Paul, what is it? What's the nature of this battle? Here's what he says in the latter part of that verse. But against the principalities, against the powers against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12b. That's the nature of our battle. We are in a war against Satan and his influences, his agents, his powers, his dominions, these that are against the world rulers of this darkness. We're in a battle against error, against sin, and its horrible effects in the lives of so many. That's what our battle is not, and that's what our battle is. Now, second point, what do we need to win this battle? I don't know about you, but if if I'm ordered to engage in some kind of a conflict or fight, I want to know the rules, and I want to know what it's going to take to win this. 
One of the reasons why we've kind of gotten ourselves into trouble sometimes over the years of history past is that sometimes we weren't really sure what the definition of the battle and victory of the battle really was. What do we need to win this particular battle? And may I suggest to you that in answering that question, it's not an either or proposition. Well, you can take a little bit of this or a little bit of that. No, it's going to take about seven things and it's going to take all seven. All seven of these are going to be required in order to win this battle. What are these seven things that are needed to win this spiritual war? Paul lays them out for us. There in that same chapter in Ephesians chapter 6, talking about the Christian's armor. Look at this list and think for a moment about these seven things that you need in order to win the war. Number one, you need the truth. Christian, you are not going to get very far in this spiritual battle if you just don't have the truth. Please do not allow yourself to be caught up in error for it is abundant on every hand. You must have the truth, the gospel, the plain, unvarnished word of God. That's tool number one in the Christian's warfare. Number two, you're going to need righteousness. It's not enough to know the truth. We're going to have to be living the truth. We're going to have to be right-doing people. You can look at a Christian and, and, and look at their life and say, you know, wow, that person is not only believes the gospel, but is living it. Now, they're not perfect. Even Christians make mistakes, that's obvious. But by and large, Christians are people who are walking in the light as he is in the light. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, they are righteous people. And you can see it in their lives. Number three, we're going to need preparation. Are you prepared to go to battle? I remember reading accounts about our nation's great civil war, about how young boys, barely 18, 19 years old, went into that battle so ill-prepared, some of them wearing a pair of shoes that was about worn out before they even got to the battlefield. You can imagine what it looked like after several months of battle. Wearing rags, tattered and torn, unprepared. They also weren't prepared mentally. They didn't know what they were facing. They didn't really know why. Many of them had no idea of the real issues involved. We've got to be prepared in this warfare. We're going to have to know the Bible. Know it. Be prepared. Peter said, be ready. Always to give answer to every man who asketh you a reason for the hope which is in you, yet with meekness and fear. So being prepared for this daily warfare for Christ. Number four, faith. Faith, which is the evidence of the things that you're hoping for. The real conviction in your heart, the assurance that says, I'm persuaded beyond all doubt that there is a God beyond the azure blue, that this God knows me and that he, I know him and that I'm going to live my life for him. I appreciated in Brother Mark's opening prayer a few moments ago, he's praying for the leaders of our nation and for our nation generally, especially in this challenging time in which we live, where there are not only the challenges of the virus and the issues relating to that, which incidentally, I, th I think, are affecting people far, far more than was ever imagined or anticipated. The harm that is being done to people. And, but, but also there was prayer for our nation's leaders and for our nation generally that we, we might, during this time, somehow benefit and be bettered because of it. And I think that's a good thing to pray for. You know, the Bible says that God is able to make all things work together for good to whom? To them that love him. So maybe we should be praying also that we might more than ever love our God and love one another. And if we do these things, 
God will bring about great good, even in a time of apparent distress and turmoil. Faith in God. And then we're going to need what Paul calls the helmet of salvation. Salvation, that is, you're going to have to be in a, in a saved condition. Now, if you're listening to this broadcast this morning and you have not yet been saved by God, that means you haven't obeyed the gospel, his terms of salvation. He's laid them out. Remember at the end of of each of these, we typically put that screen uh, there on, uh, up on your screen. You can see the scriptures. There, there are several things that the scriptures clearly teach that a person must do in order to be saved, such as repenting of their sins, confessing their faith in Christ, being baptized for the remission of sins, living faithfully thereafter. You see, salvation. We're going to need that. We can't fight this war out on the sideline somewhere, sitting out, out, out of the church. We're going to have to be in the fray. Here is where it gets tough. I sometimes tell people, you know, it's easy to criticize somebody when you are sitting on the 50-yard line of a football game in relative safety. I mean, it's easy to call out and say to the quarterback that you should have, you should have been running with that ball instead of throwing it and criticize him because he, he should have been running with that ball. But if you had been there in his place, if you had been down there in the fray, you reckon you would have thrown the ball? If you had run with it, it probably would have been toward the showers. Yes, it's easy to criticize from a safe distance. But folks, we're, we're in the fray when we're in the church, and you, we've got to be in it. We've got to be saved in order to be prepared for this battle. Next, Paul says you're going to need the Word of God. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The one offensive piece that is mentioned there in Ephesians 6, offensive, is the sword of the Spirit. A sword isn't just used for defense although it is used for that as well, but it's also an offensive weapon. And then finally, prayer. Remember that we're going to get to heaven on our knees, and we're going to need to be people of prayer. Well, those are the things that are needed to win this war in which we Christians are engaged. Here's the next point. Remember, folks, that the stakes could not be higher than they are in this spiritual battle in which we are fighting. What are those stakes, Brother Bob? Well, let me share three of them. Number one, your soul. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus asked. Can you think of anything in your life that is more important, more valuable than your soul? I think any sane person who contemplates that question even but for a moment, would have to say, that's very important, Bob. That's where my priorities must be. That's what's at stake. Do not lose your soul over this. Number two, the consequences are eternal in nature. I'm not just talking about losing one's soul. I'm talking about losing one's soul for eternity. I tell you what, if, if you are not yet a child of God, if you have not yet done those things that I've referred to there from the Word of God, you haven't been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, for example, please don't take this the wrong way, but I would have a hard time pillowing my head and sleeping tonight. And I hope you don't. I mean that in love and respect to you. Your soul is at stake, and the consequences are eternal. I don't want to see anybody. I want to see myself or anybody else standing before God in a lost condition on that last and final day. And then remember, too, Christian or would-be Christian, your influence is needed, and it's needed now. We need you in this battle. 
We have members of the Lord's Church, I guess in every congregation, who are, who are kind of on the fringe. They're not really connected. They're not really aware of, of what's going on and really plugged into the work. And that is so, so tragic. You're needed. Now, this is a pretty good-sized congregation here at Central in Martinsburg, pretty large congregation. But regardless, whether it is large or small, Every member is important and is needed. Your influence is needed in this world and in our culture like never before. Christians must rise up and be heard and must demonstrate the cause of Jesus Christ and demonstrate Christianity before a lost and a dying generation. So here's the question, Brothers and sisters, friends, neighbors, whoever you may be, think about this. If God be for us. Now, stop there for one moment and let me remind you of something. How do we know that God is for us? You say, well, you keep talking about if God be for us. I don't feel lately, Bob, like God is really for me. I mean... There's this that's gone wrong. There's that that's gone wrong. I look at my life. I look at my country. I see division. I see racial division and dissent. I see the virus and the issues relating to that. I see political turmoil. I see all these problems. Plus, I've got to tell you, my own health isn't so great. Somebody says, I, I'm dealing with, with that. They say, well, in light of all of that, how am I supposed to believe that God is on my side? I feel like God has left me. He's some way far off. How do I know? Folks, I'm going to tell you how you can know that God is for you. And in order to do that, let me remind you of some ways that you cannot know. Because these are what people often look at. They say, well, I, I just don't think God's for me. And then they look at this particular list. For example... They look at the religious world around them, and they see confusion. And isn't it confusing? I mean, look at the denominational world in which we live and in our country. Thousands, literally thousands of different denominations, all of them claiming to be preaching the truth, yet they're conflicting with one another. People, people know error when they see it. They know that can't be right. No, we cannot go by the religious world to know whether God is for us. You say, oh, I feel very comfortable in such and such church, so I know God is for me. Really? You think God is for you because you have joined some man-made church? Think about that. Does that really make a lot of sense? Folks, that's no way to tell whether God is for us. Another way not to know is by the news media. Because let's face it, you can, you can get every possible story in every possible different conflicting direction that you want by listening to the news media or the media generally. Now, you can't base your soul on that. I have literally turned on one channel of the news and listened to a story about some current event. And in just for curiosity, I've turned to another channel and gotten almost a 180-degree different story. Have you ever done that? You going to trust that? You going to base your eternal soul on the news media? I wouldn't recommend that. Another way that we cannot know if God is for us is by political parties. Political parties change. The political parties in this country of today, neither of them, none of them, really resemble what they were 50, 60 years ago. Not real closely. Oh, in some basic and fundamental ways, perhaps they do. But these are creations of men that come and they go, and they change with the times. That's not something that you can base your eternal soul on. Nor should we base it upon what our parents say or our friends say, even our best friends, who we may think that they really are looking out for us still, that's no way to know whether God is for you. The only way, my friend, is by the word of God, by taking his book, the Bible, which itself 
has been proven time and time and time again to be the infallible, inerrant, verbally inspired Word of God. And we've had many sermons on that, how you can see that. We've brought that out many, many times. This is the book that must guide my life. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. I was talking with a friend just very recently who is not a member of the Lord's Church but is very, very religious. And this particular friend does not believe in the getting on the internet. And when I was explaining, well, look, I, I can see your point. I think there's a lot of bad stuff on it. But, you know, there's also some good stuff on there. And he basically was saying to me, well, I, how can you know? I don't want to get into something and, and, and not be able to tell what's good. And I said to him, there's only one way you can know. Folks, if you are using the Internet, and I suspect right now just about everybody who's hearing me <laughs> would fall into that category, you better know your Bible. You be better be able to weed out the error and that which is harmful, that which is wrong, and just a lie. The only way to be able to do that is to, to know the Word of God. That's how we can know whether God be for us. And if he is, look at the rest of the question. Who can be against us? You know, I hope this is encouraging to you. But if you are a child of God, if you are on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are in the effective majority. Doesn't matter how many people may line up against you. It doesn't matter what may confront you in life what you may have to deal with and be plagued by and all of the problems that may assault you over the years, if God is for you, who can be against you? Paul gives this amazing list of things in Romans chapter 8, verse 35, and verses 38 through 39. Look at this. Who can be against us? Not tribulations, he says. That is trials and persecutions, anguish. These persecutions were very real there in the first century. These people, many Christians, were put to death for their faith. None of that can separate you from the love of God. Paul says, not famine. Now, we've been having a little drought in this area lately, but, you know, some of those people knew what real famine is, where there was such a shortage of food that people were starving to death. Well, even a famine cannot separate a person from the love of God. Nakedness, that is, lack of clothing. Americans don't know what lack of clothing is. We have an we have annual clothing giveaway here at the church to try to help people, and it's amazing to me. Yes, there are those who come in and they, they want used clothing, but you know what? Even the poorest in our land many times do not know what nakedness is. Paul says even that can't separate someone from the love of God or peril, dangers, the sword. Death itself cannot separate a person from the love of God. You know, sometimes life is harder than death. Paul says even life, the struggles of life and the problems of life. Angels, those, that's those, again, those spiritual beings or principalities, things that are happening now, Things that are yet to happen that you're worrying about, guess what? Not any of those things can separate you from your God and his love. The powers, think of the civil powers, the governmental powers, the authorities that, that may go against your Christian faith. They can't stop you for, from living for God. The mountains of life the heights, if you will, that you have to plod onward and over can never stop you from living for Jesus Christ, nor the depths, the valleys of sin and death and despair. And any other creature, Paul sums it up with those words by saying, none of these things can be against us if God be for us. Now, folks, I've given you those points to encourage each of us Think about this question. If God be for us, 
who can be against us? Can the virus stop you? Can racial unrest, can hatred and division and strife and bitterness, can political turmoil, can an immoral culture which can constantly assault you, can any of those things be against you? Not really. Not if God is for you. If you are not yet a child of God, let me encourage you to do the things that God says must be done in order to accept his great, graceful salvation, the plan that he has given to us, to hear the gospel, to believe it, to repent of our sins, to confess our faith, to be baptized, and to live faithfully in Jesus Christ. Our contact information I have placed on the screen before you includes the telephone number, and the email address. Please reach out to us if you need assistance, if we may help you in any way in your spiritual journey. We would be happy so to do. And so, and so till the next time, which will be 6 o'clock this evening, may God bless you. Thank you very much for listening. And remember, if God is for you, who can be against you?